Yeah, are we doing call? Yeah. So I should tell them, A. Oh. Good morning, Chapel family. Some things that stood out to me this week. One is, I told Naomi months ago, she said, can we, can we do music together before I leave for college? So we've, and we got Madeiras here too, they're all leaving for college, they're flying the coop. So I said yes, and I regret it, because I don't like singing and playing my guitar, but I'm glad that we're here doing it, giving it our best shot. We didn't get to rehearse. That's not an excuse, it's because I accidentally stabbed my wife in the calf with a broken glass shard. It's a short story. And um, she just got poked by glass sticking out of a trash bag. And we're tired. But you know what? Our God who never sleeps, our God who doesn't care if you're on pitch or off pitch, our God who knows exactly what you're going through right now, wants to hear from you, his kid. He wants to hear you sing. He wants to hear your prayers. So whether you're singing during the songs or praying or reflecting, I would just encourage you to remember that this is a us communicating to him in some instances, or it's an us declaring things to God about himself. That's what the Psalms do. So th these are things that I've walked through this week. The other thing is that we're singing a song called Jesus Messiah, and it's from like 1990, and Naomi didn't know what the song was. <laughs> so it's a good one. I don't normally do this if you're new, so that's why I need you to sing along with me. And if you hear me mess up the chords, just pretend that I didn't. Oh, and two of the three of us are losing our voices? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good day to be loved by the Lord. Father, it's a good day to be loved by you. It's a good day to be with your family, this chapel family. Lord, today we're singing about you rising from, from the grave. Today we're singing about being grateful. Today we're singing about your lordship over all. Today we're singing these songs, and it's so easy, I think, sometimes, Lord, to get caught up in just singing a song that's familiar without processing the fact that you have given us a new reality. We are new creations. We're free people. We're free from the burden and bondage of sin. We're free from condemnation. Lord, we're free eternally, and we just puddle around down here and st stumble from time to time. I pray that we would all be encouraged this morning by your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is a power, and my freedom song is mine. Sing it with us.
nothing
to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the Nothing better than you, Lord. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn mourning to dancing. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only There's nothing better than him. We sing it. It's easy to sing. It's hard to live. It's easy to say those words when so many things look better to other people if they were to look at our lives. This is an aspirational thing that I want for my life, to be able to sing this and have other people look at us and say, yeah, I think they really believe it. They give generously of their time. They pour into people even when it's difficult. No matter what's going on in their life, those, those Christian people, they're always there for me. We're there for people because there's nothing better than him. We're there for people because he's always there for us. So when we sing this, I want us to make it our hope, our prayer, our pleading. I want us to make it a reality in our hearts, Lord. Lord, make this a reality that our affections for you would eclipse our affections for anything else in this world. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. Let's sing it out right here. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. One more time. There's nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is
same sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus
gratitude in my heart, God. I need more gratitude for what you've done. I, it's so easy to spend so much time looking at everything else besides the million billion things that you've done to prove your love to us. Lord, you've proved it again and again and again. And I'm grateful that when we fall short, you pick us up. I'm grateful that you turn our shame into glory. I'm grateful that we have a lion and a lamb. That, that you, Lord, are a great conqueror, but also humble and meek and a sacrifice for our sins. So speak to us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
I'm on pink mic, sorry. From the great philosopher, the intellectual that has towered above so many in our generation, Duck Dynasty's Phil Robertson, said our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. Uncle Sai is personally my favorite from that show. Today we're talking about the salts of the earth. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, probably more than six months, you've heard salt of the earth, light of the world, and maybe you've asked yourself, what does that mean for me? And inside this Sermon on the Mount, inside this sermon where they've put together all of Jesus' main teachings in one place for us, we get this beautiful intro. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek and the merciful and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed basically are people who are needy for God. In the very next verse, if you're following along, it's Matthew 5, verse 13. You can scroll there in your Bibles. If you have the Bible, the version Bible, you can go to the Bible Events app. If you've never figured that out, how to do that, here's a little slide before service every week. The salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. Flavor. Who's heard a sermon about being the flavor of God? Okay. Preservative. Who's heard a sermon about being the preservative of God? Okay. My wife salts her salt. You're laughing. I'm not joking. If we go to any, if you've ever been to a restaurant with my wife, before she tastes food, she insults the chef by put, putting a pile of salt. She'll have a, if we get our bread and butter, what does she do, Brie? Bread, butter, pile of salt. She'll get butter just as a vehicle to stick to more salt. This is the word of the Lord. You, kingdom people, God's people are the salt of the earth. That's where that phrase comes from. If you've ever heard it, you know, if you're maybe in the hollers of Kentucky, the salt of the earth. Or the backwoods of Tennessee. Do they say that in the backwoods of Tennessee? Oh, they do. I thought it was just in the movies. But if a salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. I'll answer it. That was a failure. <laughs> if the saltiness has lost its taste. I, I don't have the greatest sniffer, okay? If you smell around me, it takes quite a pungent aroma to get me to notice you. And I know that your smell and your taste buds are connected, but here's what I do have in my brain. I kind of can feel how things should taste. So my wife bakes. I'm not a baker. Baking requires precision. If you give me a whole cabinet full of seasoning, I'll just read something, I'll look at it, maybe try to smell it, put a little on my tongue, I think this will go great in this dish. So half of the time I make anything, some Asian crock pot chicken, the kids will say, this is amazing, can you make it again? No, I, I could not make that again. What did you put in it? I just kept grabbing things and putting them in. We've got this problem in our culture of church, not out there, in here, where things taste almost correct, but they're not quite right. How many of you prefer Diet Coke to Coca-Cola? Okay. So those are the Lord's folk right there. How many of you prefer Coke Zero over Diet Coke and Coca-Cola? Okay. Those are people that are starting cults right there. And now if you had to, how many of you would be like, I'd rather have a real Coca-Cola, grade A bona fide sugar. Okay, those are people who love sweet tea and have problems with their blood pressure and such, okay? I grew up with a single mom in the 80s, so Diet Coke was it. Because back then we didn't know that it was trying to murder you, allegedly. 
So I got used to that taste. And then I remember at some point I would get a Coca-Cola from Carl's Jr. I think you East Coasters know it as Hardee's. And when you get a regular Coca-Cola after drinking the diet soda for so long, you do this. Oh, that is so sweet. And you can't do it. We have some artificial sweeteners in the family of God. Look around. There's somebody next to you. They look like a follower of Jesus. They smell like it even. They're bubbly. But they taste like metallic chemicals. Or if it's in the case of Splenda, I don't even know what's in Splenda. I just know that I saw a news article about how we're not supposed to have Splenda anymore. So as far as I can tell, I'm not supposed to eat sugar, Splenda, aspartame. So that's all sodas. As far as I can tell, I'm not supposed to have gluten anymore. Gluten's not popular, right? We're done with gluten. Dairy's bad for you now. I literally don't know what I'm supposed to eat today. Ice and MSG. You guys giggle. This is what my, when I'm making fried rice at home, Silas will say, Daddy, get out the MSG. So clearly I don't care about aspartame, Splenda, or sugar. If I were to tell you to be the salt of the earth meant to preserve the earth, that might make some sense to you. It made some sense to them. But if I were to tell you the salt of the earth is to flavor things only and it had no other uses, I would be doing you a disservice. In Luke 14, we get a little bit of a clue. Luke 14, 34, Jesus says the same phrase, but he adds some, something for us. He says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use if it's lost its taste, its saltiness. Now listen to this part. This part is weird. The salt is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's a weird one because we don't. Okay, if you're a middle schooler in here, just be prepared to giggle. Plumbing is a recent activity in uh, the history of the world. The types of plumbing we have, the fact that you can flush the toilet and it takes your mess, we don't know where. Salt was used from the Dead Sea. And the salt in the Dead Sea is not your Morton's table salt. It had what is called potash. Any mosaic people in here that worked at mosaic? Yeah? You, we fertilize stuff with that, right? Potassium. So they would use the salt to fertilize their plants to make plants grow. And then they would, when they would do their business, take a handful of salt oftentimes and throw it on their own business to cover up the stench, to add potassium to manure. They would do it to animal manure piles, to human manure piles. So when Jesus says this, he's just saying, look, if salt isn't good for what it's good for, making things grow and covering up the funk, throw it away. Covering up the funk. I love having, I have, a, I have one middle schooler right now. My other middle schooler went up to high school. I have one middle schooler. There's a beautiful age going from fifth grade into sixth grade, and sixth grade into seventh grade. Somewhere in that age bracket, these human beings start to reek. And they don't shower. Instead, they are introduced to deodorizer. And instead of showering and putting it on when they're clean, they'll take the deodorizer, the spray, and they just try to cover the funk. Back when I was younger, much younger, middle older, Axe body spray, you remember that? Some of you just tasted that sentence. I just said Axe body spray, and you were like, mwah, mwah. See, salt does something. The, the, the Dead Sea salt is full of more than just Sodium chloride, it's full of chemicals that were fertilizer that would break things down, that would take away the funk, not just cover the funk. That would take the manure and turn it into something for growth. The salt, it went put on plants because it had this potassium. It's like a rust right now. I don't know if I might be alone out here, but I am this close to getting a pair of jean shorts and white New Balance shoes. I love, I never thought I'd be this person, I love grass. Like St. Augustine lawn. 
Every morning I look out my window, I put my arms perched up on my window and I and look at my grass and I, I do the same thing maybe some of you don't do. I say, I got a trouble spot over there. I need to add something over here this part. There's some weeds over here. And I'll get down and I'm learning all these things on YouTube. I follow this guy called the Lawn Care Nut. And he tells you, you put on this thing, you get hydrotained. If this is your problem, you got these things. And I'm down there and I'm looking at my grass. When the St. Augustine, that's the grass we all have, when it gets droughted out, when it needs water, it actually folds together. And I'll never forget this because one guy said, yeah, that's the grass praying for rain. So I get down there and I don't, I don't have my jean shorts and my white New Balance sneakers yet, but I'm going to get them because I'll get down on my grass and I'm literally picking up leaves. I'm like, is that, a, is that some sort of a root rot we have here? Is this some, a chinch bug invasion? I'm investigating. Salt would make things grow and remove the funk and trans, transport this funky business into fertilizer business. This is what God's people are to the world around us. But we ran away. We did the great suburban migration. We said, we want to be left alone. We don't want to engage with media and movies. We don't want to engage with culture. Let the culture be in the cities. We're going to go to the burbs. And we just handed over the major industries of art, business, education, politics. We just handed them over to the cities. And many, many believers over the past 50 years have all retreated to the burbs. That's why we're here. Salt needs to be put on top of the funky stuff. Jeremiah is commended by God when he was taken captive in Babylon. Jeremiah said, what should I do? Should we rebel? Should we do this? How should we go about this, God? And God said, no, I want you to work for the welfare of the city. I want you to go into the city, to be a light for the city, to, to work for the, for the flourishing of the city, for in its welfare, so too will be yours. These are people who held them prison, took them away from their country, spread them all over the world, and God said, I want you to work for the welfare of that city. Salt has to come in contact. You see, we, I, I want to homeschool my kids because I've met some of your kids. I hear things that kids say. Some of you are thinking, well, I've met your kids. That may you have. If you've run into a gamer tag on a uh, gorilla tag on the Oculus, that's not me. That's him. But the, the reason I want to retreat sometimes is because it's the easy route. It's hard. It doesn't smell nice to connect with the funk of this world. To press into it. I've been hearing a big old hullabaloo a lot about this new movie. Have you guys heard about this new movie, The Sound of Freedom? So I know that Jim Caviezel, a.k.a. Jesus, and The Passion, a.k.a. The Count of Monte Cristo, his greatest film of all time, perhaps, probably not, released this movie. I'm going to go see it tomorrow. I saw some friends right after they saw it. They kind of had a ghoulish look about them, said it was a very serious movie. It's one of those movies where I apparently stop eating popcorn because it's about the sex trafficking that is going on in our world today. It's the fact that there are more slaves in sex trafficking today than there ever have been in the history of the world. It's where young boys and girls and grown boys and girls are, are sold for money, are trafficked for drugs, are used for body parts. And right now, Jim Caviezel, Jesus, the actor who played Jesus, and Mel Gibson and a few others are trying to salt that dung pile. Not only that, they're trying to shine a light on it because Jesus' next word in this sermon are, you're, you salt the things. You make things grow. You take the manure. You make it, you turn it into something useful. You make it full of the nutrients. It will make more things grow. That's what we do as Christians. We make things grow. And then he says right after he goes in this rant of making things grow, covering up the manure, he says, you are light. You're a city set on a hill. That can't be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is what a kingdom person looks like. They cover, they get thrown on the funk, and they turn it into something that's good for growth. They get thrown in the plants, and they help plants grow. What I mean by that metaphor is go into colleges, go into schools, whether you're in middle school, high school, college, 
community college, post-grad, or whether you're in a work business environment over at the base, go into these environments and say, I am going to look at the evil and the funk, and I'm going to insert myself there graciously and say, I'm here to help turn things around. We are not called to separate from society, but it's so easy to do it because, let's be honest, when we were in those locker rooms and some kid sprayed Axe body spray all over his already funky self, what did we all do? We walked backwards in a way. Let your light shine so that the world can see your good works. You guys have some pretty cool things going on in your life. I love, I love it to see. Um, we have Fifth Sunday coming up this month. Where's Michael at? Oh, fifth Sunday, going out to serve. I love when I, I see the little kids go, like a seven-year-old going to serve the homeless, eight-year-old going to serve the homeless. We make sandwiches, pack up all these things, and the, the young adults take care of all of it. They go in this back room often, they sort, they plan things out. They say, this is when it's going to go down. They go down there, they engage with those who are the outcasts. They don't just leave them there. They, they go to cause growth, to bring hope, to bring the light and salt of Jesus to them. And when the world sees that, but, but I wanted to back all the way up. So what is it? This is a kingdom person. What type of light ought we be shining? What are the good works? And it's right here, right before this passage. Do you forgive people? That's light and salt. Or do you hold grudges? That's just plain old manure. Do you comfort people? Because if you've been comforted by the Lord, you will comfort others in the Lord. And if you're like, I don't like giving comfort to people, then maybe you don't understand how much comfort you have needed from the God of the Bible. Do you give mercy to others? Because if you don't give mercy, it's likely that you have not received mercy. See, God's people, people that God connects to, they go and they change others. We can't help it. It says that our good works don't save us. I need you to hear that. If you grew up in a church, a Catholic church, or a regular church where they constantly said, do this, do this, do this, just listen to this verse very carefully. For by grace, that's a free gift, you have been saved through faith, through believing in Jesus. And this, being saved, is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Nothing you do today can make God happier with you than he is if your faith is in Jesus Christ. Nothing. You, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, if you say, he is my Lord, he died for my sins, God is maximally happy with you. And then he says, for we are his, the word there is poema, created in Christ Jesus for good works. He made you a new creation, and the Greek word is poem. He's writing a poem of your life. Some of you don't like the poem. Some of you would like to return the poem that you're currently in the midst of. But this poem of works, it's not just going to serve the poor and caring for the orphans and widows. Those are part of it, but it's being a merciful person because God has shown you mercy. It's being a forgiven person because God has forgiven you. Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all the lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for doing good works. Zealous. Are you zealous for doing good works? Do you look around and you think, I got to do some good works? Or are good works the side thing for you that you happen to do if you, if you have time for it? I would like to be zealous for good works. I think I would like to do more good works. In my spirit, I should do more. You know it's easier? To not do more. Anyone else here tired this morning? Weary? That's just me. I'm tired. I'm going to go home. I'm going to put on Justified. It's a show about an outlaw who's a lawman. I'm going to watch him shoot fictional people on the television. I'm going to fall asleep, wake up, and eat a cheese wheel or some cottage cheese if we have any. Do we have any cottage cheese? Nope. I'm just going to be sad and hungry. And I'm going to think, I should go play with my kids I should go help clean up around the house. I should go offer to help a neighbor if I hear them doing yard work outside. Thankfully, they have an electric mower, so I don't have to hear it very often. <laughs> That's just all good work stuff. I don't know about you, but man, I'm just tired. I've played the game of life at least 300 times in the past month. 
And that's not like an exaggeration. Like probably 300 times we played this silly game of life over and over because my daughter wants to do it. Do you think I want to play the game of life any more times? Not a single more time. We play it on the tablet, so at least it forces us to move faster through it. But we play life, and we got this one. We got life two. We upgraded. And with life two, it's all animated. And you get to the marriage part. You can get married now in all life, the game of life. Remember the little pink and blue pegs we had when we were kids? You'd lose them all, vacuum them up. In the game of life two on the computer or the iPad, you go to get married, and there's a blue person in a tux and a pink gal in a, a wedding dress and then a purple person in like a pantsuit with a veil. So then I have to explain to my daughter. She goes, why is this here? Who, what is that, Daddy? Because she wants to marry a boy. She wants to marry me. Every time she gets married, she goes, Daddy, I'm marrying you. You're welcome. <laughs> I've tried to explain to her that we live in Florida, not Florabama. <clears throat> and she said, what's the purple one, Daddy? What's the purple one? I said, baby, there's some people that have some things that they think about with men and women. Well, Daddy, can I marry the purple one? I wouldn't recommend it. There's a five-year-old. We just took all of our salt, and we ran over to the suburbs, and we said, we're just going to be safe. We're going to do our schools on our own, and we're going to leave the rest of that stuff to go. But there is a rising up. I don't know if you can feel it. It's not political. As a matter of fact, there's been a rising up that is pushing away from American politics and pressing into Jesus. One of the angriest pastors during COVID just repented and said, I talked about politics too much. I need to make this church just about Jesus. It was a little too late for the wear for that particular guy, at least to carry on with the influence he had, ranting and raving about political things. See, we are salt. We're not a battering ram. We are light, which means we show the way, which means we flash, there's danger, warning, don't drive here. I'm the guy. Are there any police officers here today? Maybe one or two. Okay. Look, you guys, I don't think it's illegal. I'm the guy that if I see a speed trap, everyone coming toward the speed trap the opposite direction for like the next half mile, I'm doing the high beam thing. Is that illegal? Oh, okay. Well, I do it. It's the only time people give me a positive hand gesture on the road. They yes, thank you, yes, and I love it. When people do that to me, I'm like, yes, there's a speed trap up here. I gotta know. So they would flash the lights. Or in the darkness, you see, we, we've come out here to Fishhawk, and I live in the country over there with the cows and the quails and the boars and the deer. Alligators, four houses down, a nine-footer. You're going to see some cool shoes on me next week probably. We have to get back to the basics of what it means to be a person of God, to be zealous for good works, and when we fail, not to beat ourselves up, but to press forward. When we don't forgive someone, to say, I didn't forgive you that time, but I will forgive you next time. When we don't show mercy because we're tired, hungry, hangry, we say, I'm going to show mercy. When we engage with our kids or neighborhood people, even though we don't have the energy or wherewithal to be engaging with people, my wife and I play, one of our favorite games is commit to something and then think of ways to get out of it. My wife and I play that game. And I love, I love hanging out with people when I'm there. We played the Bible, it was funny. But like, I'm like, I'm so tired. And then the people that were supposed to meet us, they're like, oh, we're not going to get there till like 7. I was like, that is 15 minutes past my bedtime. And we played it, and I had fun, and it was cool. I'm still tired. Because that's the game I play, because it's easier. But God says, be a light. What does a light do? It shines so that people can see it. God says, be salt. What does salt do? It takes takes the gross stuff, makes it useful stuff, takes stuff that is trying to grow and it feeds it. The potassium makes the plants grow, makes the grass grow. So how do we, how do we live that balance? Like, I just want to be a Christian who loves Jesus. I want my spouse, I want my kids, I want them to just love Jesus, and, and I want them to see my good works. So here's what our good works do. I just used this illustration in Band of Brothers yesterday. 
Because people often ask me, I want such and such to be saved. Can you save, people say, can you save my husband? Can you save my wife? Can you save my son? And it's the same answer every time, I cannot. Unless we're talking about like a drowning, then maybe I can, but probably won't. But they mean, can you save them spiritually? And they say, how do I get them saved? I love, I love sun sets, but there's something magical about sun rises. My life every day is one of these. I know the sun will rise. As a matter of fact, I'm convinced of it. And I like to see it when I can, when it's not the piercing through the window when you're trying to sleep. Get outside when the sun is just cresting over it. In Florida, it's not quite as cool in my mind. Um, there's these mountains in Hawaii. You know the joke, right? The mountain, that's that earth that moves upward and downward if you grew up in Florida. We'd go to the top of the mountain. There's two mountains on my island. It's my island. Um, there's Mauna Kea, which is technically the largest mountain in the world if you measure it from the base to the peak because it goes all the way under the ocean. It's bigger than Mount Everest by a good margin. And then there's Mauna Loa, and that's where you get your macadamia nuts from. Either of those mountains, if you go up toward the peak, you can sit on the mountain and watch the sun come ripping out of the ocean for the sunrise. And you could stand there all day as the sun tracks across the sky and it plunges into the ocean on the other side. If you go to Haleakala, the, the volcano that's on Maui, you can have someone bust you up to the top and that island always has tons of cloud cover. So you'll burst through the cloud cover and you'll see the sun come beaming up out of the ocean and the clouds and then you ride a bike down. It's like a two hour ride, just riding this bike down as the sun is tearing and painting through the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. This is what our good works are to do for those who don't yet know Jesus. You are to position your friends and family to say the sun is rising. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you by how I forgive you. I'm gonna show you by how I serve you. I'm gonna show you by taking the stinky stuff of life and making it useful. I'm gonna show you so that when you don't know which way to go, you know that you have this friend that will give you advice that's good and it's not because it's my advice because I plagiarize from the Bible. And what we're doing every time we do good things, every time we forgive and show mercy, every time we serve the poor, the widows and the orphan, we're showing the world around us, look how beautiful this is. Because I, if, you haven't had, if you've never seen a sunrise, maybe I'm speaking to an audience that doesn't know what a sunrise is. But it's this moment where you can stare at a ball of light burning, whatever, 93 million miles away. And it's just rising. You know what scientists can't explain? They try to explain a bunch of things. Scientists can't explain why humans like beautiful things. There's no good explanation. As a matter of fact, I think it actually goes against like the whole survival of the fittest thing. Imagine if you were just in awe of God's beauty when saber-toothed tigers existed. If you're just watching the sunrise, boom, dead. <laughs> Gotta be alert. Our job as believers, to salt and light means we're going to position people to see the sun rise. And at risk of you totally missing the corniest pastor dad joke, it's the S-O-N. We want them to see Jesus in us. We want them to see and taste Jesus in us. So all the way back to the Coke analogy, then we'll close. If you're a Coke drinker and you drink Diet Coke, you know instantly. If you're a Diet Coke drinker and you drink regular Coca-Cola, you know instantly. My hope and my prayer is that we would become the real deal, that we wouldn't try to pretend and perform. Because here's the good news. You are never going to be as amazing as you project yourself to be to us on the outside. Maybe you will be a little bit better here and there. I mean, I can be a very mean person sometimes. As a matter of fact, I just told my father-in-law yesterday, we were talking about his leg healing. Because it's the third time you've broken your leg or some parts of your leg since I've known you. And I said, Charlie, you know how the shepherds used to get control of grumpy, stubborn sheep? They'd break them in the legs and then throw them over their shoulder and say, settle down. And they would carry them and nurse them back to health with a broken leg. So I, this is how kind I am to my father-in-law. I said, so maybe God's just trying to say, Charlie, shh. <laughs> he said it to me. He's done it to me. He's broken my legs. And he says, I need you to trust 
that I'm going to get you through this because I am the author and the finisher of your faith. I started your faith. I'm going to see your faith through to completion. I want you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling because I'm working in you. The next verse says, I want you to do good things because I'm writing a story of goodness through you. I want you to position your life to see the sunrise every morning, to be captured by my beauty. I want you to stop looking at things as just worldly moments. Everything that God wired into this planet is, is screaming, love God. God is powerful and he's here for you. The stars are not there by accident. The sun, it's not an accident. The sun rises and sets every day. It's not an accident that every night you go into a state of unconscious death and you resurrect every morning. That's not an accident. You could have been an amoeba. You could have just fiddled around 24-7 until you died. God said, I'm wiring this world so that my humans who I made in my image will see me everywhere. I'm, as a matter of fact, they're going to be so dense, I'm going to call my spirit the wind so that every time they feel wind, they think of my spirit. As a matter of fact, I'm going to call breath. The, I mean, the word for breath is spirit. Wind and breath is the same word as spirit because God says, I need you to know that if you don't have my spirit in your mouth going in and out of you, you die. I need you to know that when you wake up in the morning, you have a miniature resurrection to make you grateful that Jesus rose again and will one day raise your body to immortal e eternality. And yet we fret about all these little things. We complain about little stink piles, and instead of throwing salt on them, we throw more stink on them. I do it. Facebook just trying to get me to join this thing called Threads. They just don't know that I don't even like anything else I already have. But they want to compete with Twitter, who's competing with them, who's competing with that. You know what the church needs to do? We need to stop this whole competition thing and say, there's only one battle going on. It's the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the evil one. God has won that battle, and now he wants us to go throw salt on the stinky parts of life. He wants us to throw this fertilizer on the things that are growing. That's all we are. We're just gardeners. We're glorified gardeners. We throw salt on the people. We show them, here's the way to go. Look at this light coming up. Isn't that beautiful? You want to ask how people get saved, how you get saved, how you change? Do you want to change? Position yourself to see God every day. Position yourself. And it won't be like fireworks every single day, but if you keep positioning someone, looking east, when it's dark and the light's beginning to creep over, eventually they're going to see the sunrise. If you're thinking, I have no hope, I don't know what to do with my life, just keep positioning yourself and looking because God shows up whether you believe it or not. And if you just position yourself, position yourself, read the Bible, get into prayer, do good work, serve the poor, serve the orphans, serve the widows. You position yourself, eventually God says, look. And he opens your eyes and your life changes. This is what it means to be salt and light. To position others to see the good works that point to God. It's not just this whole preservative. It's not just this whole, you know, driving out darkness thing. It's, it's all of those things, but ultimately, salt in this context, according to Luke, was used to make things grow and to take the muck of this planet and turn it into something useful. That's all this world is. Every job that you can have that's a God-glorifying job takes the raw materials of this world and it organizes them and makes something cool and amazing. I pray that you would be convicted to do that today and compelled. Let's pray. Lord, um, salt and light, salt and light. Lord, we have so much, so much artificial sweetener. Lord, so many churches that are obsessed with how moving lights can work and... Um, different programs and all these to-dos, and those aren't bad, God, but if we make them the main thing, it's, that is a bad thing. Lord, you are the main thing. You've saved us, and you've made us salty. You've given us your light to reflect into this world, and if I'm being honest, God, sometimes it's easier to just sit on my couch. My spirit doesn't want that, but my flesh keeps doing that, Lord, so I pray that you would help me, that you would give me more energy than I have had before, that you would give me more willpower and self-control to continue to face eastward, to position myself to see you, to know you, to be known by you, and help us as a chapel family position ourselves to love you well, to be forgiving to people, to be merciful toward those who differ and disagree with us. Lord, we don't have to, um, we don't have to agree with everyone's behavior to be compassionate toward them. Lord, you are compassionate for us, and you died for us while we were your enemies. And I thank you for that. 
Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet this morning. Got a couple announcements before we roll out of here. If you haven't got your kids signed up for VBS, you haven't like kidnapped your neighbor's kids and the kids down the street and got them signed up, get them signed up. We're getting ready to start all of the setup coming up this week. So Wednesday at 2 p.m. through 6 p.m., we're going to be having uh, a meeting and getting things set up and organized going for that. And then immediately next Sunday following the service, we're going to rearrange this whole place, get things set up for those kids that are uh, going to come here and have an amazing time hearing about Jesus. Also, don't forget, this month is our fifth Sunday outreach. If you have any questions in regards to that, see Michael, see Kira. They will get you guys squared away. Uh, we're looking for donations of toiletry items, uh, socks, and new underwear. And that's it. Acts. What? Prayer, no. prayer meeting no, is directly following service. And uh, Band of Brothers does this thing called Solitude Together, where we go down to a beach. And you're going to be like, this sounds weird. We go to a beach. We separate. We pray. And then we come together and we say, this is what happened to me when I was praying. Um, so that's going to be on Saturday. Men and women. Men and women 22nd. 22nd of July. Yes. 22nd. It's a Saturday morning. We get there at 8 o'clock. And I know some of you are saying, well, I can't get down there to pray. That's fine. God will love us more. And he loves you. It's not true because you haven't been listening to my sermons. Um, but it's incredible every time we go. Every time we go, when I go, uh, it's my favorite time, I go down to this back trail area and I see bioluminescent jellyfish. That's no joke. And they got the big horseshoe crabs that look like the uh, prehistoric beasts. I grab them by the tail and whip them all around. And, uh, and I'm praying to the Lord. But it's an amazing experience. July 22nd, we'll make a slide for that and put it up on the Facebookies and emails and stuff. Uh, you could give in the back. Thank you for those who do. Love you. Grateful for you. Um, it keeps the ministries going. We got VBS coming up. It's a big expense, but it's worth it because if one kid is saved, the angels are rejoicing, and we ought to as well. Let me bless you, and we'll be on our way. May God the Father put a banner over your life. It says, you are my salt to make things grow. And may Jesus reflect his light through you, a light of forgiveness and compassion, a light that reaches into dark places and lifts up the prostitutes and the abandoned a light that takes those who are poor and gives them food, a light that takes those who are mourning and gives them comfort. May Jesus put that light in your life this week. And may the Holy Spirit of God keep positioning you and positioning your loved ones, facing eastward to see the sun rise so that we can behold the beauty of our King, our Savior, our Dad. God be with you. Amen.